I'm working on building some replica replacement ballasts right now. One of these sets happened to come with an original, which I have taken apart, yeah, with the thought that I could put a new one inside of it. Here's what was inside of it, which uh, are coiled resistive wire, probably nichrome, mounted on some insulating mica sheets held in place with blobs of what looks to be cement. As you might imagine, these dissipated quite a bit of heat, like a toaster. So there's three basic ways to do this. I developed a prototype a while back uh, in a video where I went over the various options. I will include a link in the description. Briefly, briefly your three options are pure resistive, which will dissipate just as much heat as, as these did. And using wire wound power resistors, I don't think they would fit inside this. And if they did, I don't, don't think there'd be enough ventilation to, uh, to run it safely. Other option is capacitive. But you're going to need big caps like these, or larger, which uh, I don't think I'd have trouble fitting inside here. The third is diode, which works out really well in this set. And that's what I've been using while I've been working on these. The idea, briefly, is you put a uh, diode in series with the tube filaments, a half-wave rectifier. That clips the sine wave and reduces the power going to the tube filaments. It only works if the tube filament string adds up to around 85 volts or less, given about 117 volts in. If your filament string needs more than 85 volts, these clip out uh, too much of the sine wave and you won't get enough power going to the tubes. Now, if you do the numbers and add up all these tube filament strings, they aren't quite the same, and they're uh, a little bit more, or sorry, less than 85 volts, so you need some additional resistance. I ended up going with 12 ohms and 33 ohms. I'll show a schematic in a bit. For diodes, I went with one end 5408s, which are rated for 1,000 volts at 3 amps. Gross overkill, but I want this thing to be robust. Likewise, these power resistors have a power rating more than double what is actually needed. Notice I mounted the diodes at the base. Well, it's going to be mounted in the set like so, and the heat's going to be at the top. So I wanted these to be at the bottom to uh, keep them cool because semiconductors are affected by heat. You want to keep them as cool as possible. So that takes care of the two tube filament strings, but there's a little bit else going on inside here. There's two other resistors. There's this 37 ohm, which is really just there to limit the surge current to protect the original selenium rectifiers that were in the set for the voltage doubler. Selenium rectifiers don't like a high surge current. So with silicon rectifiers, eh, they also don't have an infinite capacity for surge current, but it's a lot higher, so you get away with a much smaller resistor. The other is this 200 ohm, which is in the Pi filter for the B++ supply. You don't need a very high wattage rating, really, on either one of these. Silicon rectifiers are a little more efficient. So your B++ will be higher if you used exactly the same values. So one simple thing you can do is increase this resistor. You could also increase this one, but notice there's a tap here after that resistor. So if you increase this, yes, it would be lower here, but not here. One final consideration is giving the set a bit of a soft start to let these tube filaments slowly warm up so you don't have a surge current going through them. So I put all that together in this prototype. So I limited the surge current to the whole set, both the filament strings and the B-plus supply with the CL90 thermistor. It's about 120 ohms resistance when it's cold and around 3 ohms when it's hot. So far on this, I've got the two filament strings, their power resistors, and I used a 220 ohm in place of that 200 ohm. That leaves me with the 37 ohm, which I'm going to use a little bit smaller resistor on that. These sets seem to run a little bit better with increased B plus supply anyways. And for the thermistor, well, I've got a few possibilities. The CL90 is rated for I think 2 amps. 
I've also got the CL130 rated for 1.6 amps. I think it would work out fine unless it's a lot smaller. But this is only 50 ohms cold, whereas this is 120. And then Amitherm has a new line that have a 220 ohms of resistance cold. But this is only rated for 1 amp. So that's not quite enough to do the entire set. So I think I'll just stick with the good old CL90. I'll have to mount it up somewhere in the top here. It's small enough that it will fit inside. So these last two components need to get installed, and uh, I'm going to give it a try. And there's the completed ballast. Everything fit in there with a little bit of room to spare. Where any component leads came near the outer perimeter, I put some heat shrink tubing on it. This will fit over like so. There are four cutouts around the base and they pinched in the metal at various points to lock this down. Now even if one of these leads was to brush up against this metal, this is plastic, it is insulated from the chassis, but it could pose a shock risk because there is a C line voltage present. So be careful if you're going to make something like this. This metal, well, from the heat it has got a bit of corrosion, some of the paint came off, but uh, I'm going to leave it like it is. It's got a nice patina, it's still got part of the original Motorola logo and part number on there. Now, does it actually work? Well, let's see. The lights and the tube filaments, if all is well, should take a little bit longer to light up than they did before. So, here we go. That's good, so there was a, a delay before the filaments lit up, that's what you want. As before, the 6AL5 still takes the brunt of it. Now you may have noticed if you look at tubes, like 6AU6, you may also see this is a 6AU6A suffix version out there. Same with many other tubes. The A means it's been optimized for series string applications such as this to give it a more controlled heat up time. So I think I need to swap out that 6AL5 and see if I got an A version or at least try a different one. But regardless, it has a softer power-up than it did before, and the set is coming to life, so I must have gotten things at least somewhat right. There we go. I know we've had a few duds in the past, but this year's party is going to be different. We won't have the same red punch from the cafeteria. The entertainment will not be provided cool. by the... Cool. Now I'm going to let it run for a while and then see how hot those components are getting. We still have the sparklies, so that is something else I want to tackle. Once I handle that, one more thing I want to do is uh, add a retrace suppression modification. I'm going to turn the contrast down so we get these very prominent diagonal horizontal lines. That is from the vertical retrace as the screen paints from, gets to the bottom and goes back to the top. You get this crazy zigzag. Alright, it's been running for a while now. Let's do a very scientific analysis of the ballast by just seeing how hot things are by touch. First, I'm just getting near it to make sure it's not blazing hot, so I don't burn myself. Alright, so the two large resistors, they're pretty toasty, but that's to be expected. Since they are in a filament string, and uh, the diodes do drop a lot, but the rest of it's taken up by those resistors. But they are power resistors, this one's rated for 7 watts, so we can take it. CL90 is supposed to get hot in normal operation, and it is, but not... Anything out of the ordinary, and the little guy down here, 
that's fine, barely warm to the touch. Now these minor components can be a little bit deceiving, so this may not look all that big, but that is actually a 2 watt resistor. And that is a 1 watt. And that is also barely warm. So I think we've got a winner here. So what's left to be done is seat this down and crimp that back on. Now for the other set, uh, I don't have the original, so I will dig up an octal base. I may have to scrap one out of a bad tube like this. But I'll need to find one that's got all the pins I need. Next though, I want to see if I can isolate that, uh, that static interference on the screen. So I disconnected and unplugged my over-the-air converter box and I'm now using the Suncor VG91 for a signal source. And I'm not really seeing that interference. Well, that's what I was hoping, that it's coming from the converter box itself. I do get some weird ripples as I adjust the contrast control at various points. Kind of like there's a beat frequency set up with something. That could just be the HDC circuit. I mean, these aren't the highest performing sets, so that might just be the way it goes. So right there, just a little bit of faint twisting. If you go here, we start to get some ripples. But anyways, those little speckles aren't there. I'll try some other test patterns like these. Should be more pretty obvious if those speckles were there. We'd be seeing them all over the screen right now, I would think. Try adjusting the brightness, the various levels. And I'll try it on some other channels. That's channel three. Let's try channel five. Assuming the set is set up to receive channel five. Yes, it is. So, I think that interference is coming from the converter box. Interesting. I'll have to experiment a bit more, maybe with getting a longer cable and move the converter box to a different location, or try a different RF modulator altogether if I can dig one up. So let's test out the theory that this converter box is the source of the interference. The way these work is they've got two RF jacks on the back. One is ATSC, that is the over-the-air signal coming in. It decodes the digital info, converts it to analog, and modulates it to uh, NTSC specs and outputs it on channel 3 or 4. So there's a whole mess of electronics in here. It is shielded, but, you know, there are openings in the case, like for this jack here, so I'm sure there's some RF leaking out. And it being so close to the set, maybe some of it's getting into this, which is also shielded, but not perfectly. So what I propose trying is this setup over here, which is, yeah, another box, converter box, same deal. But I'm not using the RF output of this to feed the set. Instead, I'm taking the composite video and uh, the sound output and going into this, which is a commercial-grade RF modulator. It's a Blonder Tong AM650, I think. I've talked about these in the past, as have several others, including Shango66, who did a good video on how to create a dipole antenna for them. These uh, were made for sending out a signal uh, to a distributed network of coax, like for an apartment building. So they've got your analog inputs on the back and then there's some controls on the front. You can either set for broadcast or various cable modes and then pick the channel. So you could broadcast on any channel. VHF, UHF, cable. Right now I've got it dialed into channel 3. So the RF output was meant to power coax going all say, like I said, throughout a building. 
but it also has enough power that you can have it go to a dipole antenna and transmit eh, maybe a hundred feet especially if you create one that's set for your transmit frequency so I have cut two pieces of wire to the right length for channel 3 and they're just going to the center conductor and the shield on that. I'll, I'll include a link to Shango's video where he describes how to do this setup. So if I tune the TV to the same channel I should be able to pick it up and uh, hopefully it will be sparkly free. Here's this up playing with the output of the modulator and no sparkles. So I think that's pretty darn conclusive that the source of that sparkly interference was indeed the converter box being too close to the set. Now notice these moving bars that is a common issue with using these modulators. I've heard a number of possible sources. One, the modulator may need a recap. Two, it could be an issue with the house wiring. Um, basically the 60 hertz uh, house wiring may be getting superimposed into the signal or it's getting into the power supply in the modulator itself. Well, that's on channel 3. Let's try using a higher channel and see if uh, that looks any different. Alright, I just switched the modulator over to channel 7. Now the antenna is not optimized for it, but let's see if we can get it through. Oh, and here's the good old over-the-air local low-power broadcast channel 6. One degree. Awesome. There we go. It looks pretty darn good. Still has the bar, but it doesn't seem quite as noticeable. Interesting too how well it's working even though my back pole antenna is not optimized. Channel 7. But then again I'm also only broadcasting about 12 feet. Very cool. Very happy with the quality of the image. So I was looking for something to use for a base for another replica ballast. And I noticed that metal tubes have something that looks exactly the same. It even has the same four notches in it in the same position. It just so happens this one is no good. So, I'm going to see if I can get it out. Plus, we'll give you guys a chance to see what is inside one of these for those of you who have never seen what's inside one of these metal clad vacuum tubes. And there are the insides revealed. Yes, it's actually a glass tube inside of a steel jacket which serves as insulation. To get the base off, I uncrimped those four tabs and had to use some desoldering braid on the hollow pins. I got it out. So now I can dig up some more parts and make another one of these guys. And uh, while I don't have another one of these, I don't think uh, I might be able to fabricate something to serve as an, uh, a uh, shield over it from prying fingers. Here's the second ballast ready for a test run. Basically the same as this, just uh, arrange the components a little more compactly and use a little bit beefier resistor. In place of this guy, I'm going to be replacing this one too and beefing it up. That's only a 1 water and I think uh, using that uh, 3 watt gives you a little bit more of a safety margin. The reason I say that is 
the whole set draws about an amp. We can figure we've got 0.3 amps through each of the filament strings, so that's 0.6 amps. So the third current is for the B plus, so that'd be about 0.4 amps. Well, uh, wattage is current squared times resistance, so 0.4 times 0.4 is 0.16 times 10 ohms. That is uh, 1.6 watts, and that's only a 1 watt resistor, so that's no good. Cool. Right. Ballast works a treat. And it does not kick out very much heat at all. Nothing compared to the original, which is just like a friggin' oven. That's what they had of a sheet of, of asbestos inside the cabinets above that guy because it gets so hot that they didn't want the wooden cabinet to catch on fire or get charred. All right, two last things I want to do. One is install a TVS diode across the CRT filaments to prevent it from getting burned out and power up, even though the thermistor and the ballast should do a pretty darn good job of that. It doesn't hurt to add some extra protection. Hey, who knows, it could be a lightning strike or a big power surge or something like that. You want to protect your hard-to-replace pitcher tube the other thing I want to do is retrace blanking. So there's two basic ways you can modulate the intensity on a pitcher tube. Either you fix the grid and modulate the cathode, which is what they've done here, or you can fix the cathode and modulate the grid. Well, we want to pick off a signal from the vertical output and feed it into either of these two elements with the right amplitude and polarity to blank out the screen during the vertical the retrace interval. Well, somebody has published a circuit on how to do that, but they didn't do it by some creative engineering. Actually, if we look through the various incarnations of this chassis, we get to the TS-18, we will see that Motorola actually incorporated it in the later sets. Not in the TS-4, but the TS-18, which was sort of the next and last generation of this chassis. And it should be in this Wallace Tellier somewhere. Yep, here it is. Now it's drawn differently. They've oriented the CRT differently, but this is essentially the same thing. With one big difference. Check out the grid. It's not going to ground. It's going over and down and over to this little network here. This point is B minus, or the common return, what I just referred to as ground. But it's going to a node of 220K and this 250 picofarad, which is going into the vertical sweep oscillator. So Motorola way back when figured out where to pick off a signal and the component values to use. So what I need to do is to find the wire going to pin 3 on that CRT, disconnect it from B minus and add these two components. Hopefully I'll find a convenient spot to do that. And it should work a treat. Before I dive back into this chassis, I want to apologize for and clarify my use of the terms ground and common and B minus and return. It gets confusing with this chassis in particular. So this, all this metal, all this copper-clad steel, that is not electrically connected to all the stuff in the set. It's floating, basically. But I think technically, that is ground. That's what they refer, to, that's what the, these two... I shouldn't say it's completely electrically isolated, it's sort of is used as a ground, virtual ground, for a few things. So it is connected to one side of the AC line through a 470K resistor and a 0.05 microfarad cap. Also, there are various caps throughout the filament string going to that. 
and there are some in the RF circuitry. So I guess you could think of this as being ground in terms of AC. Because it sees those caps as kind of short circuits or low resistance paths. However, in terms of DC, the only thing going to this is this 470 kilo ohm resistor. This, this line here, this is B minus or return for B plus. It is not connected to the chassis. If you're going to measure voltages, do not connect the negative of your voltmeter to the chassis. You've got to find that bus running throughout the set. So back to our modification. That is what pin 3 is currently connected to. So if we look at the bottom of this socket, they do have it numbered, which is nice. So it turns out this orange wire is going to pin 3, and if we trace it out, it comes up through a hole in the top side of the chassis over to here. This point is B minus or common. Notice it is not going to the chassis. There's a lug here to hold this terminal strip in place, but these are separate. This is what we need to cut and reroute. Now the other modification for that TVS diode, that goes to the filament, which is pins 1 and 14. And if you look at that, that is this eh, purplish and yellow wire. Yellow wire goes over to this point. And notice we've got one of those 250 picofarad caps I was talking about. That's what these things are. These are tubular ceramic caps, extremely reliable. Seriously doubt you'd ever need to replace one of these. That is going to the chassis. That is to filter RF out of the filament string. So between this point and the purple wire, I believe, is going here, which is common, yes. That can work to our advantage. So it turns out if you go to the filament strings, one side of the CRT is going to that B minus common return here, which is this point and many other points throughout the set. So between this and common, we want to attach that TVS diode. That's a little bit of a span there. Well, I would have to attach an, uh, an extension lead, but maybe we can find another point. So there's a little jumper wire from there over to here, so maybe between this point and here we can put that TVS diode. And then I'll need to dig up some resistors, or a resistor and a cap for that mod. Now 250 picofarad is not a really standard value. You can still get 250 picofarad mica caps, maybe ceramic. And 220K is no problem, but I think 220 or 270 picofarad, which is a little more common, would work as well. As far as what type, uh, again, I don't think it's critical. Uh, they don't make plastic film caps that small value, so your choices are basically are ceramic or mica. Micas are expensive, and I don't think you need to use a mica. Uh, so I'm going to try to dig up a 220 picofarad ceramic cap, and let's give that a try. It turned out I did have some 250 picofarad ceramic caps on hand. They're type Y5P, dielectric, and rated for 500 volts. Also found a conveniently unused tie point right here on this terminal strip. Here's where we pick off the signal, pin 5 of the 6SL7 tube. So there's my little cap down there going to that terminal and right next to it is B minus. So there's a 220K resistor and at that junction add an extension wire to that orange lead to the CRT and there we go. So I'm going to flip this over and try it out before I install the TVS modification. Alright, let's see how it works. And just as soon as I can find my scope probes, I will show you guys what that signal looks like. And then we'll explore what the TVS does to the waveform across the CRT filament.
I'm also curious to uh, dig up one of the spare TS-18A chassis I have lying around and see how they wired in that retrace modification with the thought being that where I placed it uh, may cause some interference, you know, component and lead placement can be critical. Cool, no retrace lines. Crank the brightness up a little bit. Turning the contrast all the way from low to high. So only if I do the brightness up all the way and turn the contrast way down do I see retrace lines, but you'd never watch the set like this anyway, so. I would say that was a successful modification. Oh, uh, one last thing I wanted to mention, uh, when I was taking this set apart, I took out some of the old wiring and I was curious about it because it looks so bright and shiny. Well, I just happened to be watching a Franz Lab video where she talked about wiring and this is the same stuff. It is Teflon coated silver plated wire. Really good stuff. Really good quality. Excellent wire. And uh, maybe in the future I'll pick some up. It is more expensive. But nice. So one of the advantages of it is being Teflon, it is heat resistant. You can get your soldering iron right up in there and it won't damage it. Also, it's stranded, but when you bend it, it stays in position. And finally, being silver plated, very easy to solder to. As well as it being very conductive, silver is actually a bit more conductive than copper.